Okay, hello everyone. I um, hope you're doing well. Today's video is not going to have any of the whizzy pictures and sounds, which I know is all tremendously exciting. We're doing it um, very basic today. Uh, we're going to be annotating chapter one. So what I would like you to do, if you have your own copy of the book, a bit like mine, make sure you're following along, pausing the video when you need to, and adding those same annotations. If you haven't got a copy of the book yet, um, then what you can do is, in your English book, just write down the parts of the quote that I've highlighted, just the whole, uh, just those parts, and then annotate around the outside of that quote um, within your book, if that makes sense. If you do know some weird fangled way to um, have the electronic copy of the book, which you then copy and paste into a Word document and then annotate on there, by all means. But I've got no idea how that works. I don't know how long that would take you, but you do you. Okay, so first thing is first. The first line of the book is always one of the most important. Mr. Utterson, the lawyer, was a man of blah, 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 blah. Um, ignore the yellow highlighting because this is a book that belonged to a previous student. We're just doing it in fabulous pink today. So why? Why does Stevenson want the very first thing we know about Mr. Utterson, who we already presume is our main character, is that, oh, he's a lawyer. Why is that important? Um, well, it could show you he is of um, high uh, respect and status within the Victorian society. Um, it's a very good job to have. That perhaps he is a character concerned with justice. I know perhaps we don't see that with modern day um, depictions of, of law shows and stuff like that, but oh well. Um, and then another thing that we could read into this, well, Stevenson, as we know from the context lesson we did the other day, studied law at university. So, arguably, but it's not certain, Utterson may be based on himself in some way. And maybe that's why he writes about him so well. Um, he sort of created this character in his own image. Not certain, but it's so, certainly something we could read into. Now what we've got is the yet yeah, somehow lovable, but it's also, you, you're counting all this bit here. Stevenson goes on to say all these kind of really negative things about him, essentially saying that he's um, not very good at talking to people, he doesn't smile much, he's not very good with emotions, he's dusty, dreary, kind of boring, yet somehow lovable. And this is the big theme within the book of duality. But of course, here it's very much scaled down. You know, he, it's not like Utterson's all good and evil. He Instead, it's like, oh, he's a bit boring, but you kind of love him anyway. It's a very toned down version of that theme of duality. This idea that man is can be more than one thing. I'm going to scan, scan down and stuff about him and that he likes wine. I like this line. Um, Though he enjoyed the theatre, he had not crossed the doors of one for 20 years. Um, now, this links to context we learnt about the Victorian gentleman. So, even though he might like things like the theatre, I know that today we see the theatre actually as maybe more of this sort of upper class thing, and you get all dressed up, and you, you go into the theatre, and you sit nicely with your ice cream, and you watch the show, but in um, Victorian times they had things like melodramas, and it was a bit more of... Um, like cheap entertainment you could say um and so it wasn't kind of this high status thing that, that we see it as today so even though he might like that he's not crossed the doors of one for 20 years we already know that he wants to be very uh respectable he may have these wishes and urges to do sort of sinful things but he doesn't because he knows that that's not the role he's meant to play in society another nice thing that we learn about him slightly further down um, he is inclined to help. He's a good man. We know this, of course, when he is the one person to intervene and help Jekyll, etc. Um, but it's nice to know that from the offset, that, that he is going to be, in some small way, a kind of hero. This line, oh, 
I inc said by Austin himself, I incline to Cain's heresy, and then you continue it, I let my brother go to the devil in his own way. Um, even I struggle with this. There's a lot to unpack here. First, you need to know who Cain is, what his heresy was, what that line therefore means, and then well, how does that link to the whole book? So we start here, because I had to write it out for myself in advance. So Adam and Eve... We all know who they are. They have two sons, Cain and Abel, and they both presented gifts to God. And um, Abel, the younger, was chosen to have the better gift. So God favoured Abel. Cain was jealous of this. So Cain just kills Abel. Cool. And then God asks Cain, where is Abel? And Cain says, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Which is a bit sassy. Um, so essentially, Cain's heresy is the line of, um, I'm not responsible for my brother. I, I don't know what's happened to him. Now, of course, we know he's lying. But really, what Utterson's talking about here is that whole viewpoint of not getting involved. You know, I'm not my brother's keeper. I'll let my brother do his own thing. Um, so what we learn about Utterson here is that instead of just being, you know, outright good like Abel or outright bad like Cain, there is a third more neutral path where you just stay out of the affairs of others. Um, but as we go on to see in the rest of the book, because Utterson goes on to do literally the opposite of, of that, he gets very heavily involved um, which at the start of the book he said he wouldn't do. And you imagine what would have happened if he'd have not been as involved as he had. Um, so we ask ourselves the question, is being neutral also the same as being complicit? You know, just because it's a bit like if you um, see a murder happen and then you don't tell anyone about it. In, in other words, you're being complicit. You're potentially just as bad as the murderer because you're allowing them to get away with it. But... Um, yeah, lot to unpack there. Very challenging to talk about, but at least we've gone over it and you know a bit more about the Bible, which is always good to know in books like these where they have a lot of references. Okay, I'm going on to my next page here. You might need to skim through your book if you have a different version um, and find it. You're looking for the bit about Mr. Richard Enfield, who we know uh, he goes on his walks with, who is his distant kinsman, as this past student said correctly. Yes, a relative, a distant one though. But this is the important bit. He is the well-known man about town. So Enfield is, again, that respectable Victorian gentleman. All right, there. And perhaps this is the reason why Enfield go, uh, sorry, Utterson goes on walks with him. It's not just because they're related, because as we see um, elsewhere in the uh, in the passage, uh, they, they don't actually have very much in common. But because he's the well-known man about time, town, if, if you're seen walking around with him, then, oh, you're also a very respectable gentleman. Good. All this status. Fab, fab, fab. We're going to see more links to that later on in this chapter. Um, and they both counted the walk as the chief jewel of each week, of course, that noun, the chief jewel. Uh, so obviously, you know, it's a valued part of their week. It's seen as important, and we link that to here as well. They value the respectability, they value um, the status that they have within their society as just being decent gentlemen. I'm now going over to my next page here, and we're going to look at this, uh, the setting. Setting is always important. It sets the mood, it sets the tone, and it can also um, give us other glimpses um, into implicit meanings, etc., etc. Um, the street shone out in contrast to its dingy neighbourhood, like a fire in the forest. So we got the street shining, but then we got the dingy neighbourhood. Again, we have this juxtaposition. How on earth can one place be so shiny and clean and happy um, and yet at the same time be quite dingy again we have this theme of duality coming out here even in the setting and we'll see it and in the humans as well later um, now we're coming on to the door and um, I love this bit 
This is about the building the door is in, a certain sinister block of a building thrust forward. Um, it was two stories high and this bit showed no window. Let's look at both of those. Um, sinister, you know, connotations of evil, foreboding. We've also got uh, plosive B sounds, which are quite harsh. Um, and then we've also got um, the verb thrust, which kind of shows it's quite forceful in the same way that, um, as we will later find out, the person who lives in is as well. And I love this bit. It showed no window. Now, obviously, we know how windows work. We all hopefully have seen one, obviously. Um, if there is no windows, perhaps this implies a certain element of secrecy. No one can see what's inside. And that's what the whole book is based on. Um, for people reading at the time, you spend a whole eight chapters wondering what the hell is going on and, and just constantly investigating, trying to figure it out until you reach the twist at the end. Next page, um, we look at the door, the fascinating door. It was equipped with neither bell nor knocker. Now, why do we have bells and knockers? Because you want... Um, people to come and visit you and say oh hello I'm here let me in uh, the lack of it suggests that you don't want that so it's uninviting not built for guests shall we say so it's a very kind of unsociable door and therefore the person that lives inside it must also be unsociable um, with this we can also link it to context again this idea of the outside and the setting reflecting what's inside it of course also links to the widely held um, Victorian pseudoscience of um, physiology I think I've spelt it right not sure probably haven't I will have to look back at this please correct it for me with your context notes um, this belief that um, again the outside is the inside, but with people as well. Um, but I think we can apply that to the setting too. We scroll on further down, and it is flashback time. Um, Mr Enfield, don't worry, you don't need to highlight that, but we know he's walking home. We're now in um, Mr Enfield's voice. Um, he begins to long for the sight of a policeman. And then we've also got empty as a church. And throughout we're going to have these uh, religious semantics. A lot of links to religion in general and God. But um, if it's empty, it's quite uh, foreboding. And this also gives us that sense. There's something eerie. Something is not quite right. And then he sees the two figures, and this one's the more important one to our story. A little man who was stumping along. Um, stumping uh, can suggest a number of things. Um, it could suggest that he's injured, perhaps. It could suggest that um, he has perhaps um, a, a disability and is having to walk in a certain way. Um, what we need to focus on is... The fact that he's little now, we already know, spoilers, this is Hyde. The fact that he is little shows that the evil side had been repressed for quite a while and was not allowed to grow. And so perhaps that is why Hyde is so little. And then what does Hyde do? He tramples calmly over the child's body. It is an oxymoron of that trampled and calmly it's very unsettling he shows no concern for the harm he's causing this girl and for us that that is just wrong uh, again we have this you know religious semantics it was hellish to see i would just highlight that and that he wasn't like a man like some damned juggernaut and of course damned again links to the hellish so obviously evil, sinful, 
Um, a juggernaut is a huge, powerful, overwhelming force. So there is something threatening about Mr. Hyde. We don't know it's Hyde yet, but we know in retrospect that it is. Um, just in case this one, the words you struggled with yesterday, it says further down here, according to the saw bones, that's another word for doctor, literally because they would saw your bones because science was very good at the time. Um, so that's just in case you need to know that. Next page. Um, I had taken a loathing to my gentleman at first sight. So had the child's family, which was only natural. Interesting. It's a natural thing for him that you loathe him. You hate him straight away. Um, perhaps it's because he is this manifestation of the hidden self and so our inner subconsciouses kind of respond to that. Um, so this is immediate and a great word for it is volatile reaction. Um, I like this line, don't have to highlight it, that the he describes the doctor as being as emotional as a bagpipe. That's just a great um, insult to hurl at someone one day. You're welcome. Um, and then the next thing to highlight, uh, I saw that the sore bones, the doctor turned sick and white with desire to kill him. Um, so again, it's that volatile reaction. And that is quite extreme, That especially in respectable Victorian society. And if you're a doctor, my God, you're respected to want to kill him wow uh and then i find this quite funny now um and killing being out of the question we did the next best things so because they can't kill hyde this is the next best thing to killing someone we could and would make such a scandal out of this i should make his name stink from one end of london to the other in other words they're going to ruin his reputation so this tells us a lot about what people value in Victorian times. So again, the respected gentleman is a very high value persona to be in that it's second to being killed, you know, to, to have that taken away from you. Um, I like this line. I never saw a circle of such hateful faces. Um, perhaps he's being quite honest about it, but it does feel a, a bit um, exaggerated. It is hyperbole. And he is really just trying to emphasise how much they hate Mr Hyde. And I think it's interesting that they've crowded in a circle. A circle, obviously, it's a circle that goes on forever and ever and ever. Um, so, like, it's like the infinite hate and perhaps also that the hate passes around just constantly and it and it does not stop um he also says that Hyde is like satan again that religious form of evil and of course victorian times being christian in belief the reader will obviously get very much on board with that and really sort of possibly hate Hyde as well and be able to imagine just how awful he must be. I'm not actually going to highlight anything on this next page so I'm skipping quite a bit out um, and we're going to this bit here. Tut tut Sinister doesn't I feel as you do Sinister Infield. Yes it's a bad story but my man was a fellow that nobody could have to do with a really damnable man and if you're damnable where are you going to hell so once again we see that um and the person that drew the check so this is about the check that mr hyde um gives enfield and he thinks oh it's a forgery because it's got this other bloke's signature on it we know in retrospect this man he's talking about here is dr jekyll the person whose name is on the check is the very pink of the proprieties it's a lovely turn of phrase what does it mean it means respected beyond doubt in other words that 
Dr. Jekyll is so well respected and celebrated as well um, that, that no one would ever doubt him. No one would ever be suspicious of him. They just wouldn't. They just wouldn't go there. So he supposes that it must be blackmail. Um, an honest man paying through the nose for some capers of his youth. This idea that Dr. Jekyll probably did something sinful in youth and perhaps is now being blackmailed by this Mr. Hyde. Um, so, um, sinned in youth, and as we know from context, uh, respectable Victorian gentleman, susceptible to blackmail. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Susceptible to blackmail. Lovely. Moving on to the next page I have here. I feel very strongly about putting questions. It partakes too much style of judgment. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, nothing there. We're going down here. And yet it's not so sure for the buildings um, are so packed together about the court that it's hard to say where one ends and the other begins. Now, of course, this can be a deeper metaphor, um, just to bring you up to speed. Um, he's talking about where the door is and that he can't figure out um, where the door links to. He doesn't understand. He, he doesn't know who lives there. There's a chimney spoking, so someone must live there, but the windows are all locked up and stuff like that. So Enfield is like, oh, how can it be so? Um, um, he's not so sure. The buildings are so packed together in that area that it's hard to say where one ends and another begins. Again, exteriors linking to interiors. Perhaps in retrospect, we can look at this line and be like um, the good and evil of men. It is hard to say where one ends and the other begins. So this in turn would become a metaphor for that. It's about that duality. Man is not truly one, but two. Just like the buildings, perhaps. Oh, it also covers the very logistical point of, in the next chapter, Utterson um, reveal, it, it's kind of revealed to us that, oh, he knew that whole time where that door linked to. He knows that it's linked to Jekyll's house because him and Jekyll are friends. He sorts out Jekyll's will, so he knows that that door is the back end of his house and is the back end of his uh, lavatory. So that's also um, important to know. Um, we are then finally told, only by this point here, the name of the man, Hyde. And names are so, so important in this book. Hyde, it is a character name. This is where the name symbolises more of what they need. So, uh, uh, where well, the name symbolises um, who they are on the inside. So, Hyde obviously sounds like Hyde. So, he's secretive. Oh, that's cut off. It could also be the hide um, of an animal. So, um, like the, the skin of an animal, um, usually with bears and things like that. So Hyde himself is described as quite animalistic at times. So we've got two different meanings uh, of that word and therefore what it could tell us implicitly about Mr Hyde. Um, and then I think that is it. And then the two men... Um, oh, no, one more thing. This is kind of like a treasure trove of quotes in this section here, all about Mr Hyde. So it's maybe nice to write in your margin here, hide, so that you can come back to this and find it easily. He is not easy to describe. There is something wrong with his appearance. We've just got to highlight keywords. Uh, displeasing, downright detestable. I never saw a man I so disliked, and yet I scarce know why. He must be deformed somewhere. He gives a strong feeling of deformity, though I couldn't specify the point. He's an extraordinary looking man, and yet I really can name nothing out of the way. Um... So, 
What's interesting about a lot of these key adjectives that he uses to describe them is a lot of that plosive, harsh um, alliteration of D, dislike, deform, deformity, displeasing. And this shows his disdain for Hyde, that real intense hatred um, and that he's wrong. And then you can also just look into the meanings of each of, of these words um, as well. This obviously links um, to that belief in physiognomy. I think I spelt it right that time. Yeah, I reckon I did. Who knows? Someone please tell me. Um, in that if he is deformed and something is wrong about him on the outside, then there must be something wrong on the inside as well. Um, what The thing that constantly is repeated throughout the book, I really can name nothing out of the way. They can't specify their point. They, they don't know why he is so repulsive and repugnant to look at. They, they can't say, oh, his teeth are pointy. Oh, he's... he's his eyes are weird. They, they, no one can specify the exact feature, um, and that's maybe some sort of message about uh, humans cannot detect evil that is present within themselves. We've got to remember. Jekyll and Hyde aren't exactly two separate people. Hyde was living in Jekyll the whole time. He was just repressed and hidden away because Jekyll was such a respectable man. The minute he lets that side free and loose, that's only when it starts to come out. If you think about it, the message of the book is that there is a Hyde within all of us. Every human being has this um, kind of sinful urges what matters is whether we act upon them and whether we let that side out. Um, perhaps this is why no one can tell what is wrong with Mr Hyde because well, we're not very good at, 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 at quite figuring out what's wrong with ourselves and if we have that inside us too, maybe that's why we can't quite put our finger on it. It's just a hypothesis. Um, so with this we should also put a uh, Hyde uh, part is in all of us. And this is the message of the book. I'm going to leave it there. Um, I'll see you guys next lesson for chapter two. How exciting.